everyone, and welcome back to the Research VR podcast, the podcast behind the science and design of virtual reality and spatial computing. <laughs> and uh, today I'm your host, Oz Balabadian, and with me is Peter Lekhoff. Hey, Peter. Hello, everyone. Hello, Peter. And today we are going to be talking about the Magic Leap 1. Ah, the one episode we have been excited about for years. For years. For years about um because we, we really have been we that's true for a podcast that really concentrates on display technologies on optics and and how physiologically things work when it comes to vr and, and spatial computing um the, the magic leap has be, really been something that we've talked about a long time we've talked about the problem of vergence and accommodation um and, and the various ways the various solutions to fix it and um Today we're going to talk about Magic Leap and if they accomplished some of the problems that they set out to accomplish, to solve. Um, and what does that look like? You know, what what were their solutions? Uh, why were their solutions the solutions that they picked? And, um, and what we can expect moving forward. So without further ado, this is the Magic Leap. Um, we, this, I don't, don't consider... I wouldn't consider this a fully comprehensive review of the headset. For that, I will refer to our friends at Tested uh, that did a really awesome, like a 15 minute long review, video review about the headset, you know, the controller, the OS, all that awesome stuff that you can go into. Um, and if you're interested as a developer, like what is being done on the development side of the Magic Leap, we highly recommend you check out uh, the Twitter page uh, called Made by, Made with Magic Leap. And there's there's all these developers and part of something called the Leap Squad that really have been pushing the boundaries of like what can be done with a device uh, like the Magic Leap one. Um, so highly encouraged to check out some of their experiments and projects because there's some really solid ideas there. Um, but today, again, like I said, we are concentrating on just the display technology. This is something that we have been excited about. And that, that was, to be quite honest, this was the first and the the main thing that I really cared about. I didn't want the hype to really, you know, either build expectations for me or to, to you know, I didn't want to approach this headset with any positive or negative connotations. Um, I just wanted to see, I was very much expecting to see a next generation display that, that had accommodation built in as a core functionality. Um, and what we got was not particularly that. Um, so let me describe, let me describe the, the scenario. Um, and actually as a full disclaimer, Magic Leap has been running this program to give creators and developers in this community uh, a Magic Leap so that they can start experimenting with it, building with them. Uh, and I luckily was one of them. So thank you Magic Leap for giving me a headset. Because uh, I sure as hell was not going to be able to afford one by myself. Um, so, but so I mean, and and, and just as a note, I re I do think the Magic Leap One is of quite a decent AR headset, and it's something that I'm using for a personal project, a, a a documentary film, a volumetric film that I've been working on to to premiere to to premiere in VR. But now we'll also have an AR component uh, because the formatting the format of that film works super well. For both headsets, um, we'll talk way more about this, huh? Oh, um, yeah, that's what I actually go. What I was going to ask, you know, when do you expect when it comes out? We'll talk more about this in the next few months. Um, it's been something that I've been working on for the past year, but I haven't felt like it's been in a good position to to publicly like reveal yet. But we're we're getting there. Um, so with that, all with all the caveats aside, and you know, I think it's a fine headset. The the first time I put on the Magic Leap One, the first thing I wanted to try was putting a plane far away from me and a plane very close to me and closing one eye and switching focus from one plane to the next. This was the first thing I tried when someone gave me a demo of a light field mixed reality headset. Uh, this was the Avagond prototype that they were showing off uh, about a year and a half ago. And... I was very much impressed with with that, and this is something that doesn't exist yet in VR, or at least not in the consumer side. Um, and I thought Magic Leap would be like I was expecting Magic Leap to really knock me out of the park on this, just on this element itself. If you've been listening to the to this podcast, you've heard us talk about 
the vergence accommodation problem. Let me give you the background as to why I put these planes in front of each other and try to switch focus. Um, so the vergence accommodation problem has been something that VR or stereoscopic displays have had for the last, I don't know, decades, right? Even for as long as they have, they have existed in research. Um, it's because we only use two it's because of the way your eyes work and will because a lot of listeners have heard this before we'll we'll keep it short virgence is a way of your eyes going cross-eyed essentially by looking at something up close right if you hold your fingers in front of you and you look at it your eyes are crossing over each other and um to an outside outsider if they're just looking at your face you look like cross-eyed <laughs> and that's kind of the way that's one of the ways your eyes really can determine where something is in space it's by using two cameras right two eyes and then the the difference of rotation that they do that they pull on each eye uh, gives that physiological uh, feedback that your brain can use to understand oh that this thing is you know this many centimeters in front of me or this many meters in front of me that but you can imagine that stops at a or because, hmm. but you can imagine that that actually is not enough. A second way we can understand where things are in space, right? Understanding depth is you don't even need two eyes. You can use just one eye. And if you close one eye and you look at that close up object, that hand or that finger, you realize everything behind that hand is blurry. And that's it's a similar effect to what we see in, in cameras and film, right? It's like a nice technique you can use called focus pulling when you're moving the, the, the thing you're focused on in the video from something up close to something far. And it's a really nice way of directing attention, but it's actually mimicking the way your eyes work. Um, it's this aperture inside of your eye, this lens that, that can, that can go, uh, grow, that can constrict or grow big and, and it allows for more, more light to come in and focus on different things and different focal planes. And that is called accommodation, right? Just remember these two things, vergence and accommodation. Vergence, think converge. Accommodation, thinks, think lens or uh, focus pulling. VR headsets, the HoloLens, and every other stereoscopic display currently only supports vergence. It's because the lenses themselves are fixed at a focal plane at typically around a meter or a meter and a half in front of you, but they have two screens, so one screen per eye, and each screen shows a slightly different image. And so your eyes can basically converge on the on the thing in the in the world, and your brain can understand where that thing is. Um, however, this breaks at certain distances. Like if you hold up something up really close to your face in VR, you're not going to be able to focus on it properly, and it actually kind of gives you a headache sometimes if you if you look at something up for up close for too long. That's called eye fatigue. Um, that is something that Magic Leap has set out to fix. That was always, even if you go back and read that AMA that, you know, Ronnie Abovitz did about three years ago now, um, that was the main differentiating factor that he really wanted to point to was the fact that he said, 3D stereoscopic displays, you know, are physiologically incorrect and there was a controversial comment in there about it them causing you know perhaps uh some damage some kind of permanent damage to your eye which to and thank you to our audience actually you guys are a pretty awesome bunch of academics and researchers um i've reached out to a few people that are researchers in, in the perceptual fields uh, to ask about this claim like is there really any any evidence to suggest that if you look at something that let's say is you're converging on, but isn't in the right focal plane for where your eyes are focused to, like, does that cause any sort of damage? And no one really seems to have any, any concrete of evidence of it causing any sort of like semi-permanent to permanent damage. If anything, it just causes eye fatigue. Um, if you do it for long enough and I mean that, 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 that um, but, but that is not permanent damage. Yeah, and there was also this one paper that was actually um, frequently quoted by by the CEO, right? The zone of comfort predicting visual discomfort with stereo displays that when we actually managed to read through because it's a pretty long paper, it kind of is not necessarily answering uh, anything that is related to the magic leap. So I would argue... I, I, I did figure out, Peter, actually what... It can be used to relate to. Okay, now I'm excited. 
the one piece of science that we've seen Roni uh, link to is this paper that Peter just mentioned. And it's a, it's basically something built to test. Um, it was a paper or it was a study built to test um, 3D displays and seeing how much pop, up, pop out effects you could do without it causing eye fatigue. So, you know, your, your cinema display is at a fixed distance from you. Um, you're focusing on at that distance, but with the way, you know, 3D movies work, you can have things popping out of the screen or pushing into the screen. How far do you have, how much wiggly room do you have with that before it really causes any, any sort of trouble? True. Yeah, exactly. Trouble being discomfort, not permanent damage or anything. Um, they came up with this, this chart, basically this, not a linear chart, but it's a sort of, um, logarithmic chart of, uh, of, of how much room you have to push things in and out. And it actually, the, there's a bunch of variables, like one, one variable is the distance from you, from you to the screen. Um, is the second variable is like the, the size of the screen itself. Like there's a few variables that are, that, that can be measured. And it's like, I mean, basically they had a few, they had a few significant conclusions. So, I mean, what they basically look, you know, is kind of cinema style setups, right? Where you have like those huge um, projections in front of you. And this is also, to, to, to be honest, I mean, this paper is very, very, very detailed, but it's, you know, I think 22, 25 subjects, whatever they had. And also a lot of the statistical data they performed on uh, subjective questionnaires that while being scientifically valid also leave, you know, certain room for interpretation. So, yeah, it, it basically the conclusions that they were able to draw or this chart that they were able to build, um, I think is what Roni is using as justification for the near clip plane cutoff of the Magic Leap 1. So if you've, if you've heard about this or read or, or try the Magic Leap, you can't really get up close to objects, right? They, they clip off things at 27 centimeters, which is right where the first waveguide focal plane is. Um, so that's, if you, if in, in like whatever term, if you put your arm straight out, it's pretty much where your palm is like that, that is as close to virtual objects as you can get. Um, so the one of, so this is a huge topic, right? Like why, why pick this, this distance? And we've seen Roni basically say this is within the physiological safe zone of operation. We're like, huh, like what is, what does that mean? And, and so the, the only, again, the only science that they've linked to, and they're, they're saying that there's a white paper uh, being worked on that's going to, you know, answer Change a lot the of these questions. And I'm excited to read that when it comes out. But this paper, I think they're using to point to saying, if we can only use fixed focal wave waveguides, then essentially this fixed focal waveguide can be treated the same way as a 3D TV, where you have only a set wiggle room of how much vert of how much pop out and push in effects we can do from that fixed focal plane. Um, so if you have that focus plane be way close to you, let's say you know a few centimeters away from your face, that wiggle room is going to be very small. So you would need to put a lot of waveguides next to each other to account for that the small shifts of focus planes. Again, things that are up close, we are much more sensitive to focus. So we have the, these focal planes. Another word for it is called diopter. These di we have a lot more diopters that are closer to us than are further away. So the further they go out the less, uh, more room we have for like pushing and push out of it. Is it, is it kind of so, similar to a lens of a camera? You know, you can kind of, you know, focus on yeah. things in front of you and have a nice bouquet, but try to focus exactly. on a building 100 meters away and have a bouquet. It doesn't work out. You have to open, uh, you know, the, the lens all the way up. So the F stops. And you have to be way more sensitive with like focusing at things up close, right? A little bit of moving, uh, like a little wiggle of the focus, um, of the focus, dial on a camera with with focusing at something closer is a lot more sensitive than trying than focusing at at infinity and everything being in focus and maybe to mention that's why the you know virtual projection of an oculus rift or you know htc vive is usually roughly around 10 meters away from you right i i well, i think it's not 10 meters but like uh with the oculus dk2 and i think with currently they're like meter to meter and a half okay is the but, focal but distance still, that they pick a lot, yeah Right, because that so so that meter and a half is a good middle ground. If you were to pick one focus plane, 
that you can focus for your eyes to accommodate to. A meter and a half is distant because you, because you can have games that are using the very far field, you know, and things will work well there. And you, you can still have productivity, productivity apps and things that are up close in your eyes will comfortably focus on that as well. Um, I think an optics engineer told me you have about a half a diopter of wiggle room between where you're focused at and what you can converge on. So half a you know half a diopter in front and half a diopter uh, behind. These are the pop pop out and push in effects that we we're talking about. So for Magic Leap, you know, at some point it seems like they went from having a, an actual light field display, something that is projecting. Did we sorry? Did, did we define that light field display yet? No, I think we should, we should first do it. Yeah. Sorry if I'm jumping around. Um, a light field display, as far as we have been understanding it, and we've covered this in the past is a form of display that is that is projecting different rays of light at your eye so that some rays are in focus and however you can switch your focus you can look around this this bundle this volume of light and be able to switch focus and look at something else this infinite depth of field idea yeah it's ba it's basically when when you look around yourself, you see light, and everything that you, you see is a reflection of the light being bounced off. And technically, one could argue that even a photo is kind of a slice of a light field because it just it's a slice. It's a, a, it's slice. a very yes. thin slice. But with a light field display, you can imagine stacking photos on top of each other so that you're holding a, a deck of pictures, and you're able to like focus through these photos, the focus at the things that are closer to you in the photo focusing on things that are far from almost every definition that i've seen of light field both on the camera side right Cam light field cameras are supposed to be capturing um the light of things that it's capturing from many different perspectives so that focus can be shifted um a light field display is the converse of that or the inverse of that where you are you can switch your focus on the display side rather than the camera side so um there there are kind of two sides of the same coin but again, so it seems like Magic Leap has been building really advanced optics, and it's from the demos that we've seen, the pictures that their um, their early prototypes, the WD one, the WD two, uh, things like called like the Beast. That's the earlier version where it wasn't even a wearable device yet. They had really advanced light field optics where you could be switching focus. But at some point, um, and we saw this in the patents. They started. They stopped patenting, you know, crazy advanced forms of display technology, and started patenting wave stacked waveguides, where each waveguide was a fixed focal plane, and the other waveguides were fixed at other focal planes. And they were trying to essentially see how many waveguides would you need to really cover the the full spectrum of diopters in front of you. Um, so from the patents, we were expecting five waveguides. And in reality, it seems like that is both too expensive, too um, too hard to produce, uh, too uh, not opaque, because like these waveguides actually are are stopping light, you know, real ambient light from going into your eyes, uh, and a lot of just like you know problems that I don't even know about because I don't work on the supply chain side of these things. Um, it seems like they just went with two waveguides and these waveguides though the, and if you have two waveguides to pick and what focal planes are going to are you going to pick you're not going to pick things that are up close you're going to pick things that are far away um so the, the the closest being 27 centimeters which is quite a bit away this also works in the favor favor of waveguides because waveguides are limited in their field of view and because they're limited, if you have anything up close, anything, any object in, in full scale up close in AR, it's going to get cut off by that field of view. And they're like, okay, let's not worry about things that are up close because they're going to get cut off anyway. Let's just stop. Let's just put the near clip plane at 27 centimeters. Um, things where we can expect things to be fully projected in a waveguide. And then we can set the right focus to that and then just, you know, not have to worry about things up close. And maybe just as a side note, um, we had actually an episode uh, 47 where we discussed uh, NVIDIA researchers uh, or I think it was doing during a NVIDIA very, conference. Yes, mm -hmm. it was um, a SIGGRAPH. Exactly. Think, the last Re year's SIGGRAPH. Yes, yep. researchers demonstrate 100 degree dynamic focus IR display. So they were actually kind of very humble and called it a dynamic focus. 
which is nice. They right. didn't even call it, yeah. uh, you know, light fields or anything. <laughs> there were, I think, I mean, I, I don't know specifically at what display technology they were using. Perhaps it was, you know, it was probably better to call it not a light field display because maybe they were like a very focal display in, in VR is a way of moving either the panel or the lens in front of the panel back and forth to create different focal planes for you to be looking at. And that's this is how, if you guys were following Facebook's half dome prototype that they showed at F8, they supported this idea of deep focus um, by by moving the, I believe they're moving the optics back and forth when, when you're looking at something up close. And on top of that, they also at OC5 talked about that they had to this this idea of deep focus is they have to blur out I guess on the software side the background rather than just rely on on your eyes focusing at something up close yeah actually that that makes sense especially if you don't have a light field yeah if you're not using a light field display if you do even move the optics so that you're focusing at something up close everything the video behind you know, the RGB image that's being rendered is still going to render everything at full sharpness. So you do have to blur out the things in the background. So anyway, Oculus seems to have some interesting machine learning tech that they've been working on for that. Um, so again, these are deep, deep concepts. I'm sorry if you, if I'm jumping around or if it's hard to keep up with, and but hopefully you are. And if you have any questions, we're happy to to help clarify these these things. And and actually, just to throw a plug out there, um, I did a shorter version of this podcast as a video on my YouTube channel um, that I'm currently editing. So if you want to see a more visual, a simpler explanation of all these things. Check it out um, on on YouTube under my name Oz Balabanian. So, where where are we? Am, am I making sense, Peter? Yes, you are. are, we, I mean, are I mean, we on track here? We're definitely on track. And uh, just to underline one fact, I mean, this concept of light field display and the concepts of displaying um, basically multiple uh, planes or like unlimited planes this is something that like, a lot of research has gone into, right? And so there have been a lot of different companies trying to achieve it. And what's very interesting, um, maybe to highlight is the technology that Magic Leap might have pitched in their early pitches, right? It was based on those rotating, um, what was it? The fiber fiber scanning displays. Yes. And we should oh, also yes. definitely plug the, the article from Mr. Uh, what's his name? Carl, Carl Gutag. Gutag. Yeah. Because he actually yeah, described it... in one of the articles how it um, might have been and how it cannot work, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, you say what you will about patents with companies and and how much you can rely or how much you can understand about what a company is doing from its patents. But Carl was one of the first people that was was reading Magic Leap's patents and was saying there's literally no way in hell that a fiber scanning display would work at the resolution that you want it to or even create a clear, you know, RGB image that you want to. And the only um image of a real of of like an of a fiber scanning display that even exists, like it just looks like a, a hue shifted blue image, and it's like doesn't really work very well. Anyway, I don't think that's even what Magic Leap ever built or showed off to anyone. It seems like the the er earlier iterations that they had were some sort of a perhaps a reflective kind of a um, a reflective surface with like a DLP projection, uh, similar I think to to. Well, I don't want to say anything factually incorrect, but uh, it seemed like they had more advanced optics than than a waveguide display that they were licensing from uh, a company called Omnivision, which is what's going on currently. Yes. Um, where this where this leads us is honestly to Twitter. Oh yes. <laughs> this is. Um, I think the Twitter. I mean, honestly, Twitter is definitely the main reason why you are so much engaged into this topic, aren't you? I yeah you, you know I can't I can't deny that when when I see tweets coming out you know that are arguing that Magic Leap One is not a stereoscopic display or I see you know tweets coming out that say we are producing a discretized light field digital light field signal and you know nobody really understands what these terms mean um, it makes me slightly skeptical to and actually encourages me to look into these these terms and see, you know, what is being actually factually said here? You know, are these terms at all 
descriptive of what what they're supposed to be describing are they the right label to even put and and you know say what you will about marketing and and trying to um take these very advanced physics physics concepts and breaking it down for the everyday consumer like that's dude that's our bread and butter right we like to yeah. take these very complicated things and and try to break it down and i know this this episode is not a very good example of it cuz we're not really describing well i don't know at, le- at least i think we're hopefully we're describing things simply but um when you try to use more advanced terminology and jargon with like with reporters that don't know better it to them it sounds like oh this is something advanced than anything i know so i'm just gonna go along with it right like even (laughs) i'm hearing like i hear roni use arc minute when it comes to talking about um you know what is the display density right the the, the, rev, the resolution that you want to be projecting at rather than using conventional terminologies like pixels per inches or pixels per degrees which is a little bit more accurate for um, a, a head mounted display he uses the term like arc minute instead of arc instead of like degrees or instead of radians and like <laughs> these things I know from the reporters and friends that I have that are like, what are these, you know, like it it requires some Googling, it requires some looking into and... But not just for reporters. I mean, honestly, this episode is, I think, one of the most prepared ones because we actually had to go through all those definitions, through all those words. And I mean, we are definitely not experts, but we did so far, you know, over 80 episodes, we have been you know, doing a lot of stuff related to this whole ecosystem. And we are both cognitive scientists, so we should understand science. And it still took an enormous amount of time to actually pile it up. Yeah, especially on the on the display side, like, you know, how is a waveguide different than, or how does a waveguide work? And how do these other AR uh, displays work? What currently exists? What are the limitations? What even can be produced on a mass scale or what makes sense? Um, it, it really took a lot of, of, of research on our end and, he, and that's, this is us being in this field for the last, you know, three years. Um, so I, I guess I have a few tweets that I want to point to and just kind of point my finger at and be like, what? So first, the, I mean, we already kind of talked about the, the claims about permanent damage or, you know, whatever neurological damage, which again, we found no evidence of and even speaking with researchers that are active in the field, they don't know of anything. Um, um, the second one is like Roni arguing with someone that the Magic Leap One is not a stereoscopic display. Um, and so I was like, okay, why? Why would you say this? And and I and even turns out, even in his Reddit AMA, he was also talking about the same thing that. He's trying to differentiate the Magic Leap One from 3D stereoscopes or 3D stereoscopic displays, and this, these are, you know, everything from a hundred-year-old photogram-looking displays, right? Which is like a, basically a piece of tin with like two lenses and a picture in a stereo picture you put in front of and you look at it. And like again, these are fixed focal displays. Even today's VR headsets are fixed focal displays, and he wants to make the distinction that the Magic Leap will have because it has accommodation support is not a stereoscopic display that really is i think misleading and i don't i don't think that makes sense at all especially when you at the end when you, what you deliver is a waveguide display that has two fixed focal lengths and it's like because you have a second waveguide at a different focus point you get to not call your headset a stereoscopic display and so there's like this this whole twitter thread that i'll link to in the description like him going back and forth saying stereo stereopsis is not stereoscopy and it's like um stereoscopes do not enable normal eye function but like ours do and it's hard for me to like agree with that especially when the magic leap one often often has so much trouble even switching to the right focal plane for me like 90 percent of the time it is not i'm at i have something up very close at, as close to that as it can render it and it's not switching to the right focus plane and i force it to go into that plane by converging my eyes like which is not physiologically normal eye function and it switches into that right plane and then it switches right back when i when i actually stop converging my eyes um the switch itself is also slow there's a uh, there's a big white balance difference between the two waveguides. Um, there's the, I mean, obviously there's the, the discoloration 
the just the chromatic aberration problems of waveguides um, that I don't think really that there's any way around it because of just the way waveguides work and the way you have to you know split up the RGB uh, signals into their own specific sub waveguides, which then create this like ghosting effect. And there is also once again the Carl Gutek. Um, blog articles that we will link to and he actually went through the process of doing thousands of photos and uh, like comparing different screens and showing in fact um, that what we see in the magic leap uh, mainly the, um, the waveguard driver that is from uh, Omnivision um, I mean technically from what the website from Omnivision states is that they actually can do full HD per one instance of their technology. So one of those waveguards should technically be capable of doing full HD, but it seems that uh, with the Magic Leap, they do only same one fourth of the resolution. And then through what he shows in the article, it is also pretty clear that you're not getting that many pixels anyway, because I mean, first of all, it's less than what the panel could do. And then it's also through the blurring effects and all the other are uh, very easy to pick up in uh, photo format, and he has all the photos on his blog. It's, it's, it's very easy to see that the image quality is not that high. And I'm really pointing out to his photos because from what Azad has been describing and from what I heard from a lot of people trying this device, I think when you put it on, overall the experience is quite good, right? So it masks it a lot. Yeah, that's exactly what I've been saying is like, I I actually I really do like the Magic Leap one. I think it's a pretty decent headset, and, and I'm very excited to develop for it. And 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 at the end at the end of the day, when you have virtual characters in your room, or you have little objects that are you know responding with the physics of your room, it's it's re you're not thinking about these focal planes. You're not thinking about you know these optics technologies. You just care about what does this look like? It's there, and it's is it responding to my head position, you know, like all these things that create a good experience. They're actually all there. They're, I'd say actually well designed around the limitations of the headset. Um, so I, I really appreciate the amount of work that's being done there. And, and at the end of the day, it's a decent headset. However, it's, it's just, I don't like seeing f science being used in a deceptive way and in a, in a jargon filled way that most people do not understand. And so that you can get away with saying the things that have been said, like, that to me just calls, if you're going to use science in that way, you're going to have the full, you know, scientific uh, <laughs> peer review, that rigor that comes with like going over every single word, if, if every, is everything being factually said? Because um, otherwise, you know, then, then science really does lose its value if you just get to use terminology as, as, as however you want to use it. Um, but again, at the, at the experience at the end, at the end of the day is not bad at all. I think it's fine. It's it's better. It's slightly better than what Hololens was able to deliver a few years ago, specifically uh, because the you know you have your peripheral vision constricted with the with the way the the, the goggles are built, and that you've concentrated on what what's more in front of you. They have much more of a darker you know visor in front, so that the, you you have deeper colors, deeper you know blacks as as black as uh, a see through display can give. Um, and apparently it blocks 85% of the ant, like light going through. So yeah, I think Carl Gutag was making the argument that like, would you, can you still call this an AR headset if it's blocking most of the light? You know, like why, why not just VR at that point? Well, I mean, eh, I get it, but I mean, it, to my eyes, it doesn't feel like it's 85% darker. Maybe it's because my eyes accommodate to the, you know, to the light source or to the uh, darker to the darker scene that's being seen through the glasses. And and I should actually mention, I had a really cool moment the other day <clears throat> where Sennheiser released this loop making, beat making app for the for the Magic Leap. And I busted out my cello and I started kind of making loops and and um, a little bit of music with my cello and my voice. And here I am sitting with a cello and, and a bow in my hand and like, and I have a controller in that same hand and I'm like, I'm, I had this moment where I like realized I have these interactive 3D things in front of me that I'm 
just controlling and because I've never, it was an experience that I've never had with the years of cello that I've played. I've always wanted to have, you know, a, a, a turn pager, right? It was all these pesky uh, pages we have to turn in, in an orchestra. I've always wanted to have like an electronic version of that and just wearing a Magic Leap one and, and interacting with these digital things in front of me really had this like, wow, this is a freaking cool moment right now. Like I feel I was not concentrating on on the headset, but I was concentrating on the music and the, and the cello and, and the virtual things I was seeing in front of me very much blended into my sense of what is in this room. Like that was a, a really a special moment that I think even though I'm I'm quite skeptical of of like see through AR, um, I I had a I had a I had a good moment there, <laughs> um, but again I'm just I just ah I'm disappointed when I see people publicly saying things that can be pretty uh, like to be held up to scrutiny and not seeing that scrutiny happen because people don't understand these terms and don't do the research of looking into it. Um, I felt that someone should say something about these terms, um, for, you know, for what they're worth, for what is worth about talking about light field displays. But I think it's really important if you're going to be, again, if your main customer base for the next three years, right, for the next couple of iterations of Magic Leap are going to be us, people that are in this industry that care about these things and that want to know what they're dealing with. You should try to. Be, you should really try to be as as transparent with them as you can, rather than try to deploy s some sort of marketing terminology that you you would want to use for consumers that don't care. Like just as an example, when when Apple says you know their cameras now have deeper pixels, like they they get away with that, right? They get away with that because ninety freaking nine percent of all their of their all their cameras, their phones are being built, bought by whoever. It doesn't matter. It's they're not selling professional cameras to professional camera people. Like if if Sony did that, you know, in their new A7 whatever, and they're like these had deeper pixels, like people would laugh them out of the room. And I feel like that's the danger when it when you have when you're building something in VR AR currently, especially not a you know not an Oculus Quest that's going to be sold to you know, younger and console gamers, this is Mag Magic Leap One is not being bought by the same people that are going to buy a, an Oculus Quest. Um, you have to really be truthful and honest to your initial developer community that you're trying to foster. Like that was what the entire point of LeapCon was, this convention that I, that I ended up going to as well, was to build, uh, it was to bring everyone together, was to show them the future that, you know, like Magic Leap's got a lot behind the corner, or around the corner and there's a lot of really good developers here that are that have awesome ideas that they want to implement um so yeah i guess that's that's enough of the headset and we can talk a little bit about leapcon as well it was cool i i went down there with a few friends uh with chris gallego uh, with lucas risotto and aiden wolf um and we meet we met up with a bunch of other leap uh magic leap developers um they had something called the Leap Squad, which is this group of people on Twitter that have been building. I think I mentioned this earlier in the post podcast. Them building, you know, really uh, interesting experiments for Magic Leap. Um. So the conference. I mean, I I'll just be honest. Um. I I had blocked off pretty much half to most of my week for this conference because. It was supposed to be on Tuesday and Wednesday. So we got there on Monday and this was held in LA. So we had a nice, you know, five to six, probably seven hour drive down. Um, and when we got there, we set up everything, you know, our Airbnbs. And then the next morning we go off to LeapCon. We're, yay, we're here to do the convention. And we pick up our badges and we go inside and we're sitting in a cafeteria, like looking at the the, the calendar and being like, oh, there's nothing scheduled scheduled for today. This is interesting like turns out it was only is an it was an entire day for just like private meetings and press demos which i was not a part of uh because i was invited here as a developer so i was like at first i felt bad for not knowing this but then every single other person that i talked to was also like uh what like this is nobody told me this you know we were we thought we were told this was a two-day conference and typically with conferences if you do have a press day that's like either done the the day before the start of the conference 
or not even included in that, you know, like three day or four day conference package. I mean, there are exceptions. There are exceptions like the sure, games. There can be exceptions. Where you have like 500,000 people coming. I mean, if you have 500,000 people coming, you definitely need a dedicated day. But I assume there weren't any 500,000 people year round at conference, right? No, it was much, I was definitely much smaller, a little bit more intimate than that. And I didn't want to be, you know, I don't want to give them flack for this for too much, especially it was, it's their first conference that they're organizing. But it just, if I didn't know people at this, at this conference and in, in this industry, I would have just literally sat there by myself the whole day, just being like, well, I'm, uh, <laughs> I wish I was at home working, but thankfully there was, there was enough people that I could interact with and just, uh, exchange ideas. Um, the second day was the conference or sorry, the second day was the keynote, which I actually woke up sick and I decided I'll just watch the live stream from bed and then go into the talks and the conference afterwards. And it was, it was a great call because it ended up being like kind of like a three hour ordeal. Um, lots of, lots of discussions, people, guests, um, I was the one thing, actually, the biggest takeaway from that whole conference that they was a very small detail that they glanced over in, in their product roadmap was the fact that they will have two six DOF controller support over the next few quarters. Um, the reason why that's so important is because uh, this is something that Tipper Dad talked about. This is something that last week's episode Lee talked about is that if you want to be developing for an AR application, Really, the 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 most important one of the most important aspects of AR is going to be how you interact with this world, and for that you need both hands. Like you need two hands, you or you need two controllers, and a lot of people now are using virtual reality as a way to develop for AR headsets that don't exist yet. Um, so the fact that Magic Leap is is thinking about two controllers and is going to be supporting it soon, I think goes to show where they think their input method, you know, their inputs will go in the future as well. Um, that was a big question that I had in my mind. Like, what are what's going to be the input method that we need to start thinking about and developing for now so that it's not outdated by, you know, generation two or three? Uh, it seems like VR really has at least nailed the, the basics of what VR's input methods will be for the next few years. You know, the both Vive Wands and the touch controllers and the new Quest controllers all share the same amount of buttons. Um, with Knuckles also being in a similar boat, except kind of adding in some more extra features like the capacitive, you know, finger tracking and and all that fun jazz. But for the most part, we know what VR's input method is going to be. With AR, we're still in that phase where we're figuring out: is it hand based? Is it controller based? Can we still use mouse and keyboard? And I, th I and I do think. Um, at least if we're going to be doing things on, you know, for gaming or for cinematic experiences, like controllers will probably still be useful. Um, cause there's nothing like pulling a trigger if you want to be firing a gun rather than, you know, doing a hollow lens, uh, pinchy pinchy tap up in the yes. air um <laughs> but what you just described leads me to a very you know kind of a point where the future of magic leap might be because one of the things that they've shown and actually you know emphasized during the leapcon is their focus on you know the enterprise apps and you know professional 3d design like they show some sketchup demos some wack wacken stuff uh, some cut data so computer aided uh, design stuff so it, it shows that they are definitely exploring the markets that are way more juicier, and I will explain why in a second. And also there was some news that they have now a 500 million uh, deal with the U.S. Army, right? Um, US they, Army? I did hear about a military contract, but oh, I don't know about contract, the. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know about the amount. Is that is that? I think it was something. Where did you Where did you read that? Uh, I have to double check that. Quick pause. Um, yeah, as far as I know, there wasn't any amount that was actually announced but there there does seem to be a military contract in the works but in terms of what was announced at the the keynote i think it seems like they're really trying hard to make sure there's a, there's a healthy grassroots developer community that is you know continually building things for this platform bloomberg uh, is basically saying that the contract which could eventually lead to the military purchase purchasing over 100,000 headsets uh, of program whose total cost could exceed 500 million. So yeah, 
That's basically that's just the, for buying headsets, essentially. Yeah, I, I guess that's basically the main deal of the deal. So, I mean, it's definitely a lot of money. And my point is, I mean, look, um, Azad is definitely a creative person. You will most likely, with a very high probability, create something amazing with this device because the device itself offers, as it seems, a lot of um, opportunity. However, the question is, for whom will Azad create it? For whom did uh, you know Angry Bird uh, company uh, Revo or Rival, whatever they called, uh, created their demo? For whom are those things? And to me, right now, I don't see any consumer buying the Magic Leap. And honestly, I also don't see any consumer buying a Magic Leap in the next few years because I don't expect the prices to drop that hard. Um, I mean, I or the content to really be yeah. there when it comes to gaming. Like, if VR has really been able to stay afloat and and actually have positive sales figures because there's been a solid like inflow of 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 the of content and games and and films that are being developed for it. I think. You know, you can do cinematic experiences, but I really have a hard time. I think gaming in augmented reality is m much harder a problem than trying to build a game for VR, especially because you need to be like every every room is going to be different for AR and you have to account for that with those differences. Like the enemies have to be coming from the right part of the room, you know, for the uh, reacting to whatever object and hiding behind the right things. I think the, all the procedural gaming, um, you know, advancements that people have been researching and building will have to be essential for AR to actually make sense, um, because you can't just have a static level that you are running through the exactly. same way you do with a game or in VR. Um, so it's hard to see that. I mean, that the match, the Angry Birds launch, I think, was kind of. I don't know. It was confusing to me because it's like exactly the youngest. Yeah. It's like the youngest audience exactly. that doesn't exist when it comes to these devices. Yeah, that's my point. I mean, they won't buy this device very soon. And you also clearly see that, you know, Magic Leap being, you know, a company that needs at some point also to earn money is actually going exactly after the markets that actually are very promising regards augmented reality. And that is, you know, military and that is, uh, you know, 3D design and stuff. And those are very corporate like uh, companies. And here's the point like, when you want to target corporates, you cannot basically be, yeah, we are rewriting your visual cortex. And also, our displays are doing light field and magic and unicorn dust. I don't think they will actually like it a lot because, from my experience, corporates yeah, are even overwhelmed. I mean, yeah, I mean, corporates are overwhelmed yeah. with the HoloLens. And the HoloLens is having Microsoft behind it, which is like very good at approaching those corporates, right? So you don't see a wide yeah. acceptance of the HoloLens, even though Microsoft has those channels. So I am really confused about the way Magic Leap tries to present itself as a very hip, young, innovative, uh, crazy, hipster, amazing <laughs> unicorn dust company, yeah. which it can do. I mean, why not? But then kind of still going after the same. Yeah, especially when it comes to like even the things they were talking about in the keynote with like the Magic Verse and the, the layers of reality. Oh, yeah. Like, I think those are all fine and great, and I think those are really important things to think about, but it's just not, I just don't see it being relevant in the next few years, especially where these are the most important, you know, growing years for AR to to gain adoption with the right with the right customers and the right people that are going to be giving you money and building content and, and applications for this new, you know, platform. Um, it's hard to imagine to really to it's hard to imagine who's Magic Leap who Magic Leap's customer is over the next few years. Um, someone made the point, I think it was Carl Gutag talking about this being used in factories. The Magic Leap one with its peripheral vision constriction and its darker, you know, opaque vis visor. Um, Carl Gutag, yeah, talking about uh, workers in factories and you know workers in enterprise. It's it actually poses a safety risk to not to block the peripheral vision of these workers. You know, you can imagine someone sitting in a in a crane or a something that uh, you have to be doing in a factory. And yes, you know, they're having a virtual overlay of the things of of markers and things that you have to be uh, moving things to and doing. However, there's like there's a lot of health and safety standards that these factories have to have to abide by and 
from what it seemed like the HoloLens was built for, although the experience of the constricted field of view was very apparent and it, and it created a bad like you know cinematic experience, the fact that they had it fully open was, I think, an enterprise choice. Like this is something that can be en- implemented into a factory. And uh, again, where when these are the f- first customers that are going to be giving you multi-million dollar contracts, um, it makes sense to build with them in mind. It seems like Magic Leap really doesn't care about that, and and they're trying to go after people like me, people like you, Peter. People, people that are interested in like cinematic experiences, new interesting experiences, which is fine, dude. Like we love these things here, but I'm just, I don't think there, there are that many of us, right? There aren't that many of us that are into tech and cinematics and like weird trippy cog sci, you know, blending of technology. Uh, there's, there like, is, there yeah. is a different point. Uh, there is another point to that. Look, I'm totally in love with XR, and I want to see more crazy, amazing technology. But the reason why I wanted to spread, right, the reason why I want a mass adoption of XR is because I know from science, and I've seen a lot of cases where you can actually improve something with XR, you can help people with XR. And sure, of course, you can also have nice entertainment with XR, but I mean, my main motivation, I assume a lot of people who are, you know, that crazy into Coxa and basically, you know, trying, you know, to get a mass adoption of the stuff is, you know, that all hospitals have finally, you know, VR and some pain management stuff. So there are more PTSD stuff, uh, or <laughs> there are more PTSD, uh, mitigation, uh, and PTSD helping, uh, assistance from those technology. And I mean, look, magically burned or, you know, got a lot of money, you know, $2.4 billion is a lot of money. And they can use it for whatever they want. I mean, it's capitalism. But if they, on the one side, are somehow trying to use this amazing wealth to bring a device that I, as a techie, someone, you know, deeply in love, is, you know, how many pixels does it have, you know? Yes, I, I love it. But I think it's missing out point where what they've been saying is not what they've been doing. I mean, I would totally be happy and underlie, uh, I would totally be happy and actually sign what they've been saying. Like, you know, we want to change the world, we want to create holograms, we want to, you know, rewrite the visual cortex. Fine, but then do it. What they just released is a slightly improved version of the HoloLens. I don't see a mass adoption happening with that device. I mean, it's a dev kit, but it doesn't have to be a mass adoption. But what yeah, comes up yeah, yeah. They don't, they don't, obviously, yeah, We don't, nobody is expecting mass adoption. There's no reason to, you know, you would be silly in thinking that, and and a lot of people made the mistake with the, you know Oculus One, the CV One, and and the Vive. Um, but I just I hope they don't position themselves in a wrong way, where it's the the the, the strategy that they're trying to pursue might be okay in, in you know in the future in the next five years, but just doesn't make sense for now. And if the strategy is, you know, to use these terminologies and these words to impress more investors into giving you more money, then, you know, good for you. Keep keep raising money and 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 being able to, you know, bring people on that hype train of of light field displays. Um but it seems like the reality from that that is actually created from that is nowhere near the the expectations that are being that are being set up um and it's and it's and it's up to us it really is up to us to like be wary of these terms and to actually look into these terms and to educate the people that care um because again we've been in it for a few years and a lot of these terms we had to go through very like meticulously and, and understand what is being said here and what 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 is fact from fiction um so I hope this has been somewhat of an informative podcast. Uh, and, and like I said, I don't have particularly negative opinions about Magic Leap as, a, as the headset or even the company. I actually, uh, I, I, want to, I want to throw a shout out. Michael Hazani, you've been doing an incredible job when it comes to the, devel- the developer community that you've been fostering um, to, to you know, showcasing the really interesting use cases that people have been coming up with. And and I think there's actually a lot of really good design choices that were made for the headset. The fact you know, the light pack that is in your pocket rather than being in your head is not bad at all. I think you can probably you know have a bigger battery in there and more processing than you could on your head. Um, the the way the the optics are are 
being designed around with the with the goggles or just on the UI side. Like, I think there's a lot of really nice touches that were put there, um, and a lot of love and care that has been um, put into put into this device. And, and for them, like, I commend you for for pushing this this industry forward. However, on just like Silicon Valley is so known for you know overhyping things that aren't really there and like you know trying to just charm your way through these things and i know Sil- you know magically was not a silicon valley company but they were in silicon valley to fundraise and 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 they use a lot of silicon valley terminologies and and strategies and as i you know live in san francisco and 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 deal with a lot of companies here i just grow wary of of things that are that <laughs> are just common uh, ways of doing of raising money in silicon valley that just are not are not consumer friendly um and also and that brings note, the world forward yeah. right yeah i i guess i mean maybe you can make the argument that like you know if they hadn't made these extravagant claims about light fields then the ar industry itself would not be you know at the pace that it's growing at now the same way that if facebook had not bought oculus like the vr industry would not be here now but i I don't i don't think those are equivalent situations um to be comparing to but that's just me as a correction actually i'm just realizing this now the the near clip plane is not at 27 centimeters but at 37 centimeters is what i uh I would have been able to find. Um, and it is another aside, if you want to have these conversations and if you're interested in these display technologies, we have a channel in our Discord in our Discord group called Dis- Display Tech, where we, re- we really like to dive into these uh, d- discussions and and talk with each other. So yeah, you can find you can join us there and, and if you have any more thoughts about Magic Leap. Or some insights. Share some or some insights. So, um, at, that's, that's that. And I think we might have an, I would love to talk more about kind of AR and pass through AR. We, for the past few episodes, we've kind of covered about, covered some topics about, you know, designing for AR, which I'm very much excited about. And, and that's kind of one of the, one of the main core reasons why I found myself in this field was, was to re, was to apply cognitive science, you know, the way your brain works into how things should be designed. Um, so if you like this conversation, you should go and check out, go back and check out some of our previous episodes. Um, in particular, the, the one with Lee Vermuden, uh, the, the founder of Modbox, mm. who's been doing a lot of design for AR. Um, and, um, apart from that, thank you all for listening. You can find the Research VR podcast Twitter at Research VR Cast. You can find me at Azadux. And you can find Peter at Resilio. And thank you to all the Patreons. Yes. Thank you for all the Patreons. I will give you a shout out at the end here. Um, And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next time. Goodbye. Bye.